Tonight's broadcast is being broadcast live on a web webinar and webcast around the nation and around the world. On behalf of Boston University School of Theology, let me welcome you. My name is Ted Cart. I'm Director of Development of the School of Theology and also the host and sponsor with the Lowell Foundation of tonight's lecture. Tonight is a really special night for me personally. And I want to first say thank you to the Dean, Mary Elizabeth Moore, for her encouragement that we go forward with tonight's program, knowing that the Red Sox were going through all this. <laughs> it's also a special night here at the school because this is the kickoff event for Alumni Weekend at Boston University. So how many alums do we have with us tonight? A few, yes. Let's hear it from the alums. The Lowell Institute, for many years now, has been sponsoring lectures across New England. This is one, literally, of hundreds. But it's a very special one for us at the School of Theology. Ten years ago next month, Jean Robinson was consecrated Bishop of New Hampshire. The headlines went around the world from the moment of his election to the moment of his consecration with doomsayers proclaiming that this was the end of organized religion as we knew it. <laughs> that wasn't an altogether bad idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> On the other side, though, there is a deeply rich human story. It's a human story I've been privileged to share for, as we figured it out, for about 30 years now. Jean and I first found each other as we were in the midst of coming to terms with our own lives, each in different parts of the country, each in our own way. That remarkable process of coming out and coming to terms and of coming to life was happening to both of us. And we were also experiencing different responses from the church. In his case, he found early on welcome and appreciation. In my turn, in my place, I found rejection and silencing and basically thrown out on my ear. But it was a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> For in that experience, I learned, as you will also hear tonight from Jean, the deeper truth of what it means when an institution says yes and says no. And along those lines, it's a human story a richly marvelous human story. A story about coming of age, of coming to self, and of digging deep into a soul to find out, does anybody live here? Does God really care? And do I really care about God? In both of these stories, Jean's and mine, we discovered in our own separate journeys a remarkable kinship that has bound us ever since. And in that, I rejoice, because some months before that election, Jean was visiting my home in Cape Town, South Africa, where I was then serving the church. And that phone call from New Hampshire came, that I will never forget, to inform him that he had indeed been nominated to the Episcopate of the Diocese of New Hampshire. We both went that day. It was a great moment of kinship, and of a certain kind of oneness, which can only come from living into a new reality. Over these 10 years, you've heard stories about Jean in newspapers, on television. My favorite shots, though, are seeing Jean with Jon Stewart. He does something in comedy that very few clergy are gifted at. <laughs> he can cause one to laugh. But over these years, I've appreciated his boldness and his honesty and his insistence that this is not a story of a church gone mad or of a culture gone wild. Both those things are true. But it's a deeper story about what God does. And if you listen to Gene for more than five minutes, what you begin to hear is a deeply faithful man who tells a much richer story about the meaning of faith and experience and how God blesses that experience again and again. Rarely on the Stewart Show will you hear an evangelist, 
But when Gene speaks to John Stewart, you consistently get the story of an evangelist. Tonight, I invited Gene to come here and share with us something of that spiritual journey. Indeed, since his retirement, he is now at a very prestigious center in Washington, D.C., called the Center for American Progress. Please, God, let that be true. <laughs> <laughs> but more importantly, he has traveled the nation in these, in these 11 months since his retirement, telling the ongoing story of what it means to live in this culture and what it means to be a person of faith. And for me, that's a richer tale. The historical survey of what Gene did and what he represents to the larger church, and particularly to those of us in the Anglican community, has its own tellers and history. But what he has done for the world of evangelism, for the proclamation of the goodness of God and the wholeness of the human spirit, is for me the most important story. And so, so tonight, I give thanks that I am delighted to welcome a friend, a colleague, a brother in the faith, and a pastor, the Bishop Gene Rollins. I am absolutely delighted to be here, and I'm going to step over here just to make sure the lavalier mic is working. Awesome. Thank you, sound people, wherever you are. There she is, looking self-satisfied and kind of proud. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I wouldn't rather just sit here and listen to Ted talk about me rather than have me dispel all those, uh, all those myths <laughs> that he spun there for you. Thank you, Ted. You're so sweet. Um, I, um, now that I've met some of you, I might change what I'm going to say, but um, uh, I, I want to warn you uh, tonight that I am uh, here to recruit you. That's something that Harvey Milk used to say, Harvey Milk, whose shoulders we all stand on, and say, I'm here to recruit you. I'm here to recruit you to get into some gospel trouble. Uh, it's what I used to always say to my deacons when I would uh, ordain them, that I expected them to get into gospel trouble. If they did stupid things, I wouldn't necessarily come to their aid. But if they got into gospel trouble, then I would die in that ditch with them. And I want to uh, put you on notice that I'm here to recruit you to get into gospel trouble, particularly as the church deals with um, the issue of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, questioning, I don't know, did, did I miss some letters there? I didn't read one of the papers. There may have been another letter claimed uh, uh, since this morning. <laughs> but uh, let me begin by just, just summarizing some of what you already know, which is how we come to be in this particular moment with respect to this issue and the faith communities of which we are a part. Uh, we're here because um, 20 years ago, certainly 30 years ago, most Americans would have told you they didn't know anyone gay. No, they might have worried about weird Uncle Harold, you know, who always comes to Thanksgiving and acts like strange, or all those two nice ladies who have always lived at the end of the street and they just keep their garden so nice, we love them. But what they would have meant was that they didn't know anyone who would unashamedly and even rather proudly let you know uh, that they were gay or lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. And now, is there a family left in America that doesn't know some family member, some co-worker, some former classmate uh, to be LGBT? Or, or as is happening uh, more frequently now, you go back for your 30th college reunion, and your good old buddy Jack is now Jackie. Mm -hmm. It's happening a lot. When I went back um, to Middlebury uh, for my husband's 20th anniversary, and was introduced as his partner, um, one of his friends said, oh, really? What business are you guys in? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, that probably wouldn't happen. Uh, 
now. And let's, re let's remember how change happens, right? You have a worldview that pretty much interprets the world to you. And then you have an experience for which that worldview is just simply not sufficient to, to explain it. And, and you enter into a, a period of, of chaos and confusion. And you come out on the other side, either denying that that experience happened or that it was all that important, or you come out on the other side with a revised worldview. You know, when, when Barack Obama says he was evolving, that's, that's actually how we all learn and change our minds. People sort of ridicule him for that, but actually that's how all of us, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, change, is that we, we evolve and we go through this. Um, there, there, uh, I have a friend in New York who says this is exactly um, uh, the, the kind of thing that happens in a family, you know, uh, a, a kid that may, who may be 20 years old or 30 or 50 or 70 years old comes home to mom or dad and says, mom, dad, I'm gay. And the family is thrown into confusion and, and chaos because they have to figure out whether their love for that child uh, trumps all the, the awful things they've been told. And, and most often, I would say, uh, at least over time, uh, love wins. Let's also remember that 40% of all the homeless teenagers living on the streets in America are LGBT kids who have been kicked out of their homes when they came out. 40%. So, love doesn't always trump what we've been told. But the confusion is there, and, and the same friend says that uh, she thinks that's exactly what um, what happened in the Anglican Communion, is that the gay kid, the Bishop of New Hampshire, came home to Dad, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and said, Dad, I'm gay. And now the family, the Anglican Communion worldwide, is struggling with what any family does, is to figure out how deep, how broad, how wide is their love, and how deep and how broad and how wide is God's love whom they try to represent. Um, it's an exciting time to be alive, and we are in this moment because so many of us have come out that now people know us. Harvey Milk used to also say, uh, you remember, uh, even if you saw the movie, uh, the, the place where he has his staff call their parents and come out? He says they, they have to know us because when they know us, they'll love us. Well, maybe not all of us, but at least a good number of us. The fact of the matter is now, when we talk about this issue, a face comes up. And sometimes a relationship, a couple that we know, comes up. And, and all of a sudden, uh, people are not willing to believe uh, what they've been told before. This is, and the, the, the really most interesting thing happening right now is that this same kind of movement, this same kind of evolution, is happening in very conservative religious communities. Um, about a year ago, I went to Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California, which cranks out more conservative pastors than uh, any other seminary in the country, I think. And it was very clear to me that the younger seminarians were looking for a way forward on this issue. Um, and of course, being uh, conservative evangelicals, it would be right through scripture. I could not uh, agree more with them about this. Uh, scripture is not to be uh, lightly tossed aside or ignored or downplayed, but you have to go right through scripture. But what was so telling is that clearly these young seminarians also had LGBT friends. And when this issue came, came up, their, the faces of their friends came up. And they were less willing to settle for what they had been taught and were looking for a way forward. So this is not just happening in, you know, crazy liberal uh, mainline denominations, but uh, really right across the board. So we're in this, in this very uh, special and new moment. And I, and I think it's fair to say that a big part of that is, is the notion that by, uh, by their fruits you will know them. And now that they know us and they know our relationships, it's hard to deny that God shows up in our relationships. And the fruits of the Spirit show up in our relationships. And if, and if uh, Jesus was right, I believe it was Jesus, <coughs> the Gospel said, 
that uh, uh, you know a, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and vice versa. So, so we find ourselves in this particular moment. But what's interesting about this moment for those of us uh, involved in religion, and by the way, anyone interested in, in LGBT issues needs to be thinking about religion because religion is at the center of this debate. Whether you're religious or not, you need to, to look at uh, how faith communities are responding because uh, I mean, we, we have people who haven't seen the inside of a church in 100 years quoting scripture on the floors of legislatures all across the country, right? I mean, uh, completely, totally non-religious people using religious arguments against us. And I, and I think the Bible is at the, at the center of this debate, not just because it's, it's important, but because at least at first reading, the scripture seems to be clear about this. Uh, about this issue. Um, other things we have to extrapolate, right? I mean, you can, you can take the, uh, the, the uh, Genesis passage about um, uh, being stewards of the earth and either use it for environmental reasons or read that same passage and uh, ExxonMobil would use it to take every drop of oil out of the ground and exploit it uh, as much as possible, uh, having dominion over the earth. So you have to kind of extrapolate, but with, I mean, what's not to understand about a man shall not lie with a man is with a woman? It just seems pretty straightforward. And so it seems to me that as religious people, we have to do that very careful and, and difficult work of talking about scripture in its context. And um, one of my favorite stories about, uh, about context that uh, Daniel Miniak uses uh, in one of his books uh, he says, uh, suppose, suppose it's the year 3000. By the way, this is a very timely story. You're going to see how, how, how timely it is. Uh, in about another hour, it'll be really timely. <laughs> uh, suppose it's the year 3000, and the game of baseball has been completely lost. No one pay, plays it. No one knows the rules. No, uh, no one talks about it. No, no one has any idea uh, about the game of baseball. And in the year 3000, you pick up a novel that was written in the year 2000, and one of the characters is described as being out in left field. <laughs> now, in the year 3000, you assume you know what that means because you, you know what left is, and you know what a field is. But unless you know the game of baseball, and, and you know that most batters bat right-handed, and so the left uh, outfielder backs up to be able to, by the way, this is a gay man using a sports image. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, backs up, and then it's become a metaphor for being out of touch, out of the loop, isolated, and so on. So in the year 3000, you would think you knew exactly what the author meant. And yet, without the context of baseball, uh, you would completely miss the meaning of that passage. Fact of the matter is, with, with the scriptures, we're, we're dealing with texts that are two to three thousand years old, written in a, in a wide variety of contexts, um, using words that, that, that we recognize, but may or may not have the same meaning that they had then. And so, um, I, in our uh, more liberal traditions uh, that, that include a, a real uh, critique of, of those texts, um, we have to be the ones to uh, equip people uh, to, to read the scriptures uh, in light of, the, of that context. And, and I think it's probably fair to say that most, most of the work done in the last 50 years around biblical studies, I think, has been uh, around, if you will, the game of baseball. That is to say, the context in which those scriptures were written. Not just, for instance, in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, the context of the Israelites, but the cultures that surrounded them. I mean, so much of, of what we read uh, in the Hebrew scriptures is in response to the idol-worshiping pagan cultures that surround uh, the ancient Israelites and so on. So, um, uh, I think that's the work that we have to do in this, in this particular um, uh, a task of, of asking the question, do those seven passages, and there are only seven, that seem to speak to this issue, 
do they say what that at least initially they seem to say? I will come as no surprise to you. Uh, my answer to that is uh, no, not really. Um, two, two quick contextual things. You, you know this, but let me just remind you. Um, first of all, um, that homosexuality did not exist in ancient times. <coughs> I know that sounds crazy. Same-sex behavior existed in ancient times. But the notion of sexual orientation, that a certain small minority of us would be born oriented towards people of the same gender rather than the opposite gender, that construct, that understanding, is only about 140 years old. It's at the very end of the, of the uh, 19th century that someone first posited the notion that a small minority of us might be born in such a way. At the time the scriptures were written, everyone was presumed to be heterosexual. And therefore, to be acting in the same sex manner was to be going against one's nature. It made sense. Notice here, I'm, I'm not saying that scripture says yippee for LGBT people. I'm saying that the scriptures actually don't speak to the context that we now find ourselves living in. Another contextual issue is uh, what was known about conception was, was very rudimentary. In fact, male sperm was thought to contain everything necessary for life. And therefore, to spill one's seed on the ground rather than making a baby was, uh, was, was tantamount to, to, to killing children. Women played no part in conception whatsoever and only served as a place for incubation. So we get all these proscriptions against spilling one's seed on the ground. A man is not liable to man is with a woman. Uh, we have a proscription against masturbation. And my all-time favorite, the so-called sin of Onan, where a husband and wife are, are uh, having intercourse. He withdraws before ejaculating, spills his seed on the ground, and God strikes him dead. Now there's some birth control for you. <laughs> some real disincentive. Now we seem to have gotten over that and masturbation for the most part. And yet a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman seems to be written in stone, unchangeable, straight from the mind of God. So it seems to me that as, as leaders in faith communities, we need to do this, this work. We need to do this work so that all of scripture, not just, not just these seven verses, but all of scripture is seen in the context in which it was written. What did it mean to the person who wrote it? What did it mean to the people for whom it was written? And, um, uh, and is there anything about the context that has changed? This has been made a, a more difficult with some of the modern, less good translations that, that many uh, of our conservative evangelical brothers and sisters are reading. Um, you know, St. Paul uses uh, two words that we, we just don't know the meanings of. One, one, it seems to be a word that he has made up, putting two words together. And the other, we don't know what it means at all. Uh, we can't find it anywhere else in scripture or in any other contemporaneous writings. Now, the New Revised Standard Version, at least, puts, puts an asterisk there. At the bottom of the page, it says, we actually don't know what these words mean. <laughs> But these newer translations that are being used by, by some of our brothers and sisters solve that little translation problem just by putting in the word homosexual. So you pick up your Bible, you open it up, and it, it, it's very clear about the condemnation of homosexuals. And yet such a concept, such a notion didn't exist. And you do violence to the holy text when you when you uh, take a modern day concept like that and plug it back into an ancient text. If you and I, as leaders in, in faith communities, don't teach people these kinds of skills, um, then we're going to be uh, subject to those texts being used in all kinds of, of uh, difficult and, and, and perplexing and painful ways. Let me tell you what I think the most important 
scripture passage is for this debate. And, and you rarely hear it. You know that St. John's Gospel is, uh, almost uh, all of it is said as a conversation at the Last Supper, uh, Jesus' last words to his uh, disciples. And he says this really remarkable thing. And I must have read it a thousand times uh, before I actually, it hit me what, what an astounding thing it was. He says to them, um, but there is much that I would teach you, but you cannot bear it right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. Now, I think he was saying, you know, for a bunch of rough, uneducated fishermen, you haven't done too badly. In fact, I'm kind of proud of you. But don't you for a minute think that God has done with you or the people who come after you. Because there is so much that God would teach you, but you just can't bear it all right now. So I will send the Holy Spirit who will lead you into all truth. For how many centuries did we use scripture to justify slavery? For how many centuries, and still, do we use scripture to justify the denigration and subjugation of women? But, I mean, was it not the Holy Spirit who was leading us into that broader, deeper truth? I think so. And the question we are now dealing with, all of us, all faith communities are dealing with this, could this be the Holy Spirit who is leading us into all truth about a different group of people? I think yes. You know, sometimes... <clears throat> The church gets criticized uh, in its, in its uh, movement uh, towards fuller inclusion of LGBT people uh, because we're just following the culture, giving in to the culture. Well, what if God is working in the culture? Because God is going to do God's justice work with or without the church. And if the church won't do it, God will find someone who will. So following the culture isn't in and of itself wrong if God is working in the culture. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I think the question we're dealing with is, could it, could it be that this is another experience of the Holy Spirit leading us into a deeper truth? I think yes. So that's that's some of the work we have to do, and, and you're going to take heat for doing it. If you're not in the bubble of Boston, or New England, or the Northeast, or the West Coast, the world hasn't changed all that much. Yeah. We've still got kids jumping off bridges and hanging themselves on, on playground swing sets because of the messages they get about themselves, mostly from religious voices, about how awful it is to be gay or lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. And, and I want to recruit you to get into some gospel trouble, to become an even greater advocate for gay and lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, children of God like the rest of us. So I want to talk a little bit about being a prophet. Um, it's, it's not always fun being a prophet. <laughs> and uh, you don't have to read too much in scripture to find out about, uh, <coughs> how much not fun it is. <laughs> Let me just describe one prophet to you. This prophet goes to the River Jordan to be baptized by John. And, and an astounding thing happens. As he comes up out of the water, the heavens open up, and either everybody hears or only he hears, depends on which gospel you read, but a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now, 
You, you just can't get a better affirmation than that. <laughs> right? Right? You've just heard God Almighty say, you're my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. The sentence that follows, which we never read on the first Sunday, uh, 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 you know, the baptism Sunday, <clears throat> is, and the Spirit immediately drove him, drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. Right? So he goes into the wilderness. And he doesn't have a conversation with the devil, for God's sake. He has a conversation in his own heart. He is torn apart inside about what shape will his ministry be. Interesting, isn't it, that the only way we know about this is Jesus must have told them. And told them for a reason. Because this is, this is the conversation that goes on inside any of us who are taking our ministry seriously. So let's see, uh, what I, I know will go the magic route, you know, the stones and the bread thing. That, that'll be popular. <laughs> no, he says. Uh, and then he thinks, well, um, I know. I'll hurl myself off uh, the parapet of the temple, and, and God's angels will come and grab me up. Sort of the Cirque du Soleil ministry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, that, that seems uh, a little too flashy. And then. <laughs> And then comes the most seductive of all. Listen very carefully. This has occurred to you. I am, I am so gifted. I've, I've just got a way with people. And um, I, you know, I can get people to work together and coalesce around a, an issue. And um, you know, I could rule the world. But I would be I would be really good at it. I would be really kind and generous and I but I I could rule the world. And Jesus says no to that. And that that evil voice goes away, scripture says, for a time. Just for a time. And then it keeps coming back. Right? And we don't know what he says yes to. We know what he says no to, but we don't know what he says yes to until he comes out of the wilderness, shows up at his hometown synagogue, is given the scroll, Isaiah, he unrolls it and reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and has called me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to release those who are captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's like his inaugural speech. He's finally come to this answer about what his life and ministry will be about, and then we see him live it out the rest of his short life. He's absolutely true to that inaugural speech. And then, of course, he goes on to say, oh, by the way, just in case you were thinking this good news is, is just for the Jews, yeah, not so much. It's really for the Gentiles, too. And people are infuriated and try to throw him off a cliff. That's what happens to prophets. <laughs> because the prophets tell you the truth that is the last thing in the world that you want to hear. And then, more often than not, they pay a price for it. And that's what I'm asking you to do. The price you pay is, is sometimes very private. And, and part of the price is not being quite sure if you're standing on firm ground. Mostly you know people are prophets in retrospect. <laughs> yeah? Um, you know, my father thought that Dr. King was a communist and anti-American and all kinds of other things that I wouldn't repeat here. Um, He's lived long enough to change his mind about that and to be 
uh, so thrilled with Barack Obama he can hardly stand it. But at the time, it wasn't real clear to everybody that Dr. King was a prophet. More often than not, you have to wait to figure it out. And the prophet himself, the prophet herself, has to wait and not know. Am, am I a prophet or am I just freaking crazy? <laughs> or just cranky? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a thin line, isn't there, between whining and being a prophet? <laughs> there's nothing wrong with anger as long as it's righteous anger, but who gets to decide if it's righteous? And maybe you can only do it uh, in retrospect. I never know if I'm being prophetic or I'm just being arrogant, you know? I depend on my spiritual advisor to help me figure out whether that little voice in my head is God's voice or my own ego doing a magnificent impression of God's voice. <laughs> And I am really good at it, aren't you? Aren't you? <coughs> so part of the part of the risk, part of the I mean, if, if you stand at a pulpit and just uh, talk platitudes, you don't have to worry about are you standing on firm ground. But you call people to task for their lives, for their integrity. And I don't know, I, I never feel all that sure about it. But sometimes I feel compelled to say it anyway. Sometimes after a sermon, I, as I'm, I'm taking my seat, I'm embarrassed. Does that ever happen to you? you you're sort of, geez, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> Who the hell do I think I am? So there better be a reward in this, right? Or else you'd have to be crazy to do it. Let me tell you what I think the, the reward is. Lots of people have asked me um, if, I, if I had this all to do over again, would I do it, or did I ever have regrets, and so on. The best answer I can give to that question is this. God has felt so close so palpably close during this last 10 years that sometimes prayer seems redundant to me. And I think the reward is when you do justice work, you get to know God better. And I'm like, what could be better than that? actually get to know God better. Um, one of the great stories of all time, and the Jews know this in spades, is the Exodus story. It's also one of the greatest coming out stories of all time, right? <laughs> but you're in some form of slavery and, and someone comes and tells you the good news that there's a whole lot uh, better place waiting for you. And, and some of you leave. Remember, not, not all the Jews left. But some of them grabbed hold of that vision and, and followed him. And they thought they had done the hard part. You know, walking down the, the streets of the Egyptian city with with the Egyptians who are still all traumatized from all the plagues and the deaths of their, their uh, firstborn, and everybody, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. They thought that was the hard part, leaving. That is, until they got to the Red Sea. And, um, and Moses, you know, gets up to the edge of the Red Sea, and you can imagine what he said to God. And it probably wasn't all that pretty. As the as Pharaoh's army closes in from the, from the back. A young priest of mine dies. Um, she says that uh, she thinks that Cecil B. DeMille got it all wrong. You know, that 
Moses didn't just throw up his arms and the waves parted and this great dry boulevard opened up and they all marched over. She said, no, I, you know, I think after a few choice words with God, <laughs> Moses gets up to the water and, and, and just goes to put his foot into the water's edge and just enough water parts for one dry footfall. And then picks up his other foot and goes to put that in the edge of the water and just enough water parts for another dry footfall. And on and on and on until you get to the other side. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't get to see the other shore mm -hmm. before you have to step in the water. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just one step at a time, and you pray to God that it's in the right direction. And they thought that was the hard part. Because after all, on the other side is the promised land, flowing with milk and honey. Not so much. <laughs> Forty years of wandering in the wilderness. Eating from everything we can understand, manna that tasted like wet cardboard. It was so bad, they even began to remember how good the food was back in Egypt. Ooh, leeks and garlic and all that. LGBT people should know about this part. You're out of the closet, you think you've done the hard part, and then crap begins to happen to you, and you think, ah, it was dark back in there, but I kind of knew the lay of the land there. Maybe I should go back. It seems to me that God made them wander for 40 years to make sure that when they got to the promised land, they didn't think they had done it on their own. That they had done it from being dependent on God. I think the reward of being uh, prophetic in some small or large measure is that when you're doing that, because, because you're just never sure, you have to rely on God. And that is a blessing itself. That's the reward, is that you get to know God. There I say, God gets to know you. And here's the key to doing it for a long time. To be honest with you, I don't really like John's Gospel all that much, and yet, oddly enough, I find myself quoting it all the time. <laughs> i got to work on that somehow. <laughs> so here's something that, that is said in John. <clears throat> Jesus says, um, my life is not being taken from me. I lay it down of my own free will. What he's saying is, I am not a victim. I'm making it an offering back to God for God's goodness towards me. Now, let me, in case you haven't figured it out yet, let me just tell you that the church, the synagogue, the mosque, the, uh, the ecclesiastical institution to which you may belong will eat you alive if you let it. It will chew you up and spit you out. And, and you can feel like a victim any day of the week. And if you do, you will become angry and cynical and burnt out, and you will be no use to anybody. The church doesn't need any more victims. If, on the other hand, you make your life and ministry a gift back to God for what God has done for you, the ways in which God has blessed you, you can do that to the day you die. And it may look pretty much the same, but you probably
probably know clergy who, some of whom, uh, you know, do a good job and are a total mess, and some who do a good job and are totally joyful. That's nothing to do with happiness, by the way. They're totally joyful. And I think it's the difference is, is whether your life in ministry is offering yourself as a victim or giving your life back to God as an offering. It's the only way we can do this work for a very long time, especially if you're doing prophetic work. So, uh, Ted wanted me to, to say something about uh, spiritual survival in ministry, certainly in prophetic ministry. So, uh, I actually used to carry around a little notebook that I called my spiritual uh, survival kit. Uh, it was just ways of reminding myself of, of, of what, I, what I needed to remember in order to, to try to continue to do this work. One is this. I learned, I learned this um, in my work as kind of the ordinary. Um, I, I was the sort of the chief of staff for my predecessor for the 18 years of his, of his episcopate. And as that person, I was the um, conflict management person, right? Uh, when uh, typically a clergy person and the vestry were fighting, uh, I would be sent in to, you know, help. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I would be driving there late on a Thursday night, and uh, uh, and the only thing I could be sure I was that although. Prior to my arrival, they were trying to kill each other. When I arrived, they would be nine in trying to kill me. <laughs> and so on the way there, I would remind myself, sometimes out loud in the car, it's kind of embarrassing, but out loud in the car, I would remind myself that no matter how this evening goes, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> If I go in and I do a really good job, get people talking, uh, we may come out with a plan and strategies and so great, I'm going to have it. Also, if I go in and I just make matters worse, nobody's listening, everybody digs in deep, I just muddied what's and you know what? I'm going to have it. <laughs> the effect of that was remembering that no matter how it went, I was going to heaven, lowered my own anxiety about my own performance that night. So that more often than not, I was actually able to be helpful. Because in comparison to the knowledge that I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be with God, and it's all going to be all right. Whatever happens on that Thursday night is very small potential. Now that may seem like, I don't know, five-year-old's theology, but I'm here to tell you it is life-changing. Because I, maybe you're not this way, but I tend to judge every situation I'm in, uh, uh, you know, by did I change somebody's mind, did I make things better, did it, you know, was I successful? The fact of the matter is my worth has already been set and proven, and uh, it is not up for grabs. The Lord of all creation became incarnate in Jesus Christ and died for me. How could I be anything but infinitely worthwhile? That's already been settled. So what happens on a Thursday night at St. Swithin's by the gas pump is not <laughs> going to affect me. And I think it's the only way we can get through the kind of anxiety that, that we're seeing in the culture right now, that we're always going to see in the culture, that, uh, and certainly if you're going to in any way be prophetic, you're, you are absolutely going to experience. So remember that you're going to have it. No, don't disrespect. Believe it. You know, I um, uh, when when I uh, 
when I was consecrated, uh, the Archbishop of Kenya uh, said that when Gene Robinson was consecrated, the Satan entered the church. And the Archbishop of, of uh, Nigeria said that gay people were lower than the dogs. And I'd like to say publicly that I'm going to be in heaven with those guys. Partly because I know that if ever gets back to them, it'll just irritate the bejesus out of them. <laughs> but, but partly because I believe it's true. We are actually going to be in heaven together. And if I've had any learning in, in this last 10 years, the, the, the one I'm most convinced of is that how someone treats you does not relieve you of your responsibility to treat them like the child of God they are. It is irrelevant how someone treats you. Your call as a follower of Christ is to treat them like the child of God they are. Period. And we're going to be in heaven together and we might as well get used to treating each other well because God won't have it any other way there. Yeah. So I believe this heaven thing. I really do. Another thing in my spiritual toolkit is uh, I highly suggest you pick a song that becomes like yours. Right? Mine was Psalm 27. But they're all kind of the same. You know, it's like, oh Lord, they're trying to tear my flesh and rip my bones from my body and, and all of that. But you, O oh Lord, will set me high on a rock and keep me safe. They all have some element of that, right? <laughs> and then Psalm 27 goes on to say, I only seek one thing, to sing the Lord's song and to dwell in God's house forever. Now this has a lot of meaning for me. Because I used to think that, that what I wanted and what God wanted was for me to, I don't know, change people's minds, convert people, uh, bring people into the church, and so on. I, I now don't think that. What I think God is calling <coughs> me to do is to sing God's song. And then let God's Holy Spirit do all that other stuff. That what I'm called to do is, is to be as good a witness as I can be, to be as articulate as I can be about my own salvation at the hands of a loving God. And then let that do whatever it might do for anybody else. I actually learned this from um, dealing with victims of clergy sexual abuse. You know, most often it would be a woman who had been um, manipulated into a sexual relationship with a priest, and, and she would want to have a meeting with the perpetrator. And I learned to say, um, if if you want to have this meeting with the perpetrator because there's something you want him to say, something that you need him to say, like, I'm sorry, or I never should have done it, or it was a violation of my own ministry, or the, yeah, then it's not good for us to have this meeting because you're still putting all the power into his hands. You're letting your own well-being be in this guy's hands. If, on the other hand, you have something you want to say, and you will judge this meeting to be a success if you say it, then it could be a good thing. And it seems to me that, that one of the things uh, for us in ministry is that um, if we're not seeing the results we want, we can get awfully discouraged awfully fast, and, and life can be kind of grim. But if we, can, if we can judge ourselves by how well we are able to sing God's song, 
if we can come out of any encounter and say, you know, I, I did a pretty darn good job of, of saying what is true about my relationship with God, saying what is true about the God that I know in my own life. And then let God do what God will do with that witness. I think otherwise we just tear ourselves apart and we get really discouraged and burnt out. But we never, you don't ever have to tire of singing the Lord's song. Yeah. And to my seminarians, I would always say, everything you do, every course you take at seminary, every <coughs> fieldwork experience, all should be in the service of you learning better and better and better to tell the story of your own salvation to the hands of the loving God. Because ultimately, it's the only thing you got. And it's all you need to have. Because it's what the world out there is desperate to hear, even if they don't know it. Lastly, I, um, on the spiritual toolkit, the, my spiritual director uh, said to me one day, and this is right soon after, um, after my election, and you know, uh, things were flying and coming my way from everywhere. And she said to me, you know, I think that you ought to shut up in your prayers. So I think you're using way too many words. God already knows that stuff. That's quite up to date. <laughs> that stuff. And really, uh, let's think about using that time for something else. She said, I want you to uh, use that time to let God do what God does best, which is to love you. She said, I want you to sit, you know, in a nice straight chair with your hands on your, on the tops of your legs. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine God's love as either light or warmth, starting at the top of your head and oozing over your body like warm butter. <laughs> That's all. Don't ask any questions of it. Don't analyze it. Don't uh, critique it. Just do it. She said, you know, when you find yourself making the shopping list for later, uh, that's just a bus that's come by and you've gotten on it and get off at the next corner and come back. Close your eyes. God's love is light and warm. Top of your head, losing over your body like one body. No words, just let God love you. I mean, it seems stupid, right? It's not stupid. What it did for me, what it continues to do for me, is that it fills up this well of, of confidence in God. It's like, a, it's like a toddler who's so assured of love at home that he or she can you know, like go out and like meet the world. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it lasts for a minute, sometimes five minutes, sometimes it goes on for a long time. But what I discovered is that I've actually got something to give when I go back out into the world. I'm not so um, diminished and empty that, that I haven't got anything. So try it. See? See what it does. But, you know, 30 seconds into it, don't say, well, it doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit with it. And trust that if God knows anything, God knows how to love you. And will. And will. <clears throat> 
So ultimately, what I would like to say to you is God does not want you for a sunbeam. God wants you for a prophet. I sang that song when I was little too. And I think that's probably what God wants a five-year-old to be. But you're not five anymore. I, I, th I think we live in a world, maybe the world has always been this way, but I think we live in a world uh, that needs prophets. That is, people who are willing to speak truth. When, when, when we least want to hear it. And I don't think you'll ever be sure that you're speaking the truth. But I think you'll know when you're, when you're called to speak those words. And then time and history will decide whether you were being truly prophetic. But I, I think being Um, being a religious leader and being mealy-mouthed is obscene in this day and time. And I think if the church, perhaps the synagogue and mosque, but I know the church, if the church is in danger of anything, we are in danger of being a community of admirers of Jesus only and not disciples. And can I just tell you, Jesus does not need or want any more admirers. Admirers have messed things up pretty well up till now. And it may be nice to come to church on Sunday morning and slap each other on the back and say how great it is to see each other, and it is. And the music's great, and occasionally you get a decent sermon, and you've always got the Eucharist, and you, you, you can't mess that up. And then, what? How does it affect you Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and so on? It seems to me that what Jesus wants is disciples, real followers. And that will not always be easy. I can, I can be pretty sure that the little voice in my head is God and not my own egos when it's asking me to do something I don't want to do. out of New Hampshire, I think most of you probably know that the big, our big lake is Lake Rumpusaki. And there was a rather famous uh, uh, local guy who just seemed to have this incredible luck fishing. And uh, they were going through one particularly bad spell. No, nobody was catching anything. And this guy was coming in every day with his land. And the locals got Suspicious enough that they called the, the uh, fish and game department and said, you, you should send somebody up here because I don't know, there's something's going on. So uh, a plainclothes uh, officer came up and said hello to this uh, old codger and, uh, and said, can I, can I go out fishing with you? The old guy says, sure. So they, they go out and make one of the to a particular cove where he said he'd had great luck. So they get there, they anchor, and, and the, the old guy uh, opens up his tackle box and takes out a stick of dynamite and lights it and tosses it in the water. Big explosion, and hundreds of fish come floating up to the surface. He starts grabbing them out of the water and putting them in the boat. And the, uh, the uh, game warden takes out his badge and opens it up and says, you're under arrest. Codger just opens up his tackle box again and takes out another stick of dynamite, <laughs> lights it, and tosses it to the game warden. <laughs> and says, You gonna just sit there or are you gonna fish? <laughs> <laughs> so that's my question for you. And for myself. Are we going to just sit here, or are we going to fish? There are, there are people right out there. Fenway Park is full of them who don't even know they need the good news that we have to give them. It's not ours. We're just 
stewards of it at the moment. But they are in need of the same good news that Jesus talked about when he was in his own hometown synagogue and that he got into such trouble for. And the question is, is the world going to see you and me in trouble because of the gospel? And if you're not in trouble for what you're preaching, is it the gospel you're preaching? It seems to me that, that the world, in addition to all the good pastoral work and all the other things, needs each of us to have a, a piece of the prophetic ministry. The world is in very bad shape, in case you haven't noticed. It's not just Washington that's broken. It's a lot of things. And, and I think we have we have the best answer going. And if you take that risk and, and you speak out for God and for God's people, for all of God's people, then I guarantee you, you will get to know God better because you will be forced to depend on God. And you will be so blessed sit there. Anglican Communion. 
Uh, is everything happy and worked out? No, no, it isn't. But we're still holding on to one another while we try to figure this out, right? Um, and I think that is exactly right. We don't have to agree about this right now. But it seems to me we do have to hold on to one another. Now the problem is, if somebody wants to leave, you can't make them stay. And I haven't figured that one out. But, but I think you can, you can uh, tell them as convincingly as you can sound that you don't want them to leave. I mean, I, my church is, the, the church that I long for is, is, is big enough uh, to include uh, the people who think I'm an abomination. It's just that it seems that their church isn't big enough for me. And I don't, so if, if, if somebody decides to leave, I don't think you can make them stay. But what I'm saying is that I don't think we should be paralyzed from speaking the truth as we have experienced it in our own faith because of the threat of schism. First of all, it may not happen. And if it does, then it seems to me the story of Good Friday is that God can bring something good out of anything bad. So that we shouldn't be paralyzed by it. Um, you know, um, the few bishops I got to talk to at the Lambeth Conference, since I was not a part of it, uh, basically said, look, we, you know, we don't get this homosexual thing. Uh, we don't understand it. I don't know, you tell us we have gay people in our pews, but you know, we don't know them. Never mind. I mean, hello, they get thrown in jail and sometimes put to death for if they come out. So that's understandable. But they said, you know, we've got people dying of malaria and AIDS, uh, abject poverty. We've got women and children being abused. We've got civil wars. We get, you know, this comes way down our priority list. Look. Why don't we work together on getting clean water to that village over there? And yeah, I know, we'll probably come to learn that some of the people who helped us get water over to that village are gay themselves. But let's just, let's just do this work together and we'll figure it out. I think that is just exactly right. And Almost every one of our dioceses has a companion relationship with, with some developing nations of the diocese. And, and that, that work continues. And that's what I mean by staying at the table, right? That takes courage on, on both sides, or however many sides there are. Um, and, and, and I think in all of these debates, that we have, especially as they, as they um, uh, cross national boundaries and so on, is we just have to remember to use I statements. We just have to begin every sentence practically with, for me, this is true. In my experience, that is true. And get away from saying, you must think this, and you must believe that. And the more we can do that, I think the, the, the greater possibility of our hearing kind of. But mostly, I would just say, uh, don't let the fear of schism, or to, to, to put it in, in, um, in more positive terms, don't, don't let the call for unity paralyzes. Uh, and might I just say, I think there are probably quite a lot of people in my own church who disagree with me about that. So I'm a priest in the Diocese of Virginia, and sometimes when I'm on the street... No, you are a missionary to the Diocese of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I feel like that prophet you're talking about. And so, you know, I could be at the airport and people actually wave at me or at a supermarket. And
people smile at me, and I usually wear a uniform because that's part of my identity. I want people to know, right? And I want people to ask. But members of my congregation, which is a church plant, who I thought had that understanding of what it takes to be that Fisher person, mm -hmm. um, actually don't know what to do. They really don't understand. My spiritual director say, you know, you just made it a little differently. It comes easy to you, sort of natural to you. But that's not the way everyone is. So I would like to ask you if you would share with everyone those maybe 101s. Mm -hmm. What does it take to be that missionary, that evangelizer, that Fisher person, from your perspective, please? Well, um, uh, one, of my, one of my thoughts about that comes from uh, being a dad, um, which is that uh, you have to, uh, the phrase is, you have to change a lot of dirty diapers uh, to be there uh, in the moment when your kid asks you some profound question. And that is to say you've got, you've got to spend a lot of time in order to catch the right moment. You know what I mean? Uh, and and it would look like, you know, that much of that time is just kind of a, a wasteful time. But actually what you're doing is you're waiting for the moment. And I, I, I think that uh, at least part of evangelism is, and the way it's not intrusive, is, is waiting for the, for the moment the fertile moment that is that is right for the person to hear. Now, in our reluctance to be evangelists, I think we would deny a fertile moment if it was staring us right in the face, right, in order not to have to rise to the occasion. <clears throat> so that's, that, that is part of it. So I think, uh, I think part of our training ought to be, uh, how, how do you recognize the moment when it might be time to witness. I know that that's that only all the Episcopalians squirm in their seats. But uh, I mean that in the very best sense, right? <clears throat> and then also, uh, you have to have practiced it. it um, I don't know why we think that someone would be good telling the, the story of their own salvation at the hands of a loving God uh, the first time. And and I, I think Christians ought to practice with one another telling that story so it doesn't seem so weird anymore. And then you might be better able to, to actually share it. Um, I, I think that, that, that there are moments that come particularly around transitions when somebody loses a job, somebody loses a child, loses a parent. Um, uh, gets a divorce. I mean, I think there are all kinds of moments that lend themselves uh, to asking God questions. I mean, that's what the Beatitudes are about, right? You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are persecuted. I mean, who would want those things? Well, the reason you're blessed when you're in those circumstances is that you're up against it. And God actually has a chance to get through. So, it that's that's why those, those groups of people are blessed. And so it seems to me that we need to recognize those moments in people's lives and not like move in on them, but like uh, have our antenna up. So when our sister-in-law is, you know, or, or uh, whatever, is going through a, a, a tragedy, you know, like listen for the, for the cloaked God questions as a, as a time to tell that story. And then just completely on the other end of, of, of the scale, uh, uh, one of my parishes in New Hampshire <clears throat> did the most amazing thing with the most astounding results. They set up, this is Episcopalians doing this, unbelievable. They set up a card table at Walmart out front and said, uh, had a big, big poster saying, um, if there's anybody you'd like for us to pray for uh, on Sunday, uh, just come and, and tell us. <laughs> Episcopalians? <laughs> Are you kidding me? And, and incredible numbers of people stopped and chatted about someone who was sick, someone who was facing this, their kid just 
didn't get into college or whatever, and just gave them all kinds of, of uh, opportunities. They just set up a card table, put up a sign, sat there, Saturday morning. That's the best, best I can do. Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm Hi. Lambert Roming, uh, president of the Association of Black Seminarians. Fantastic. But my homies just call me Lamb, so feel free. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I Are you a Methodist? African Methodist, yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's, that's probably better than just plain old Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, 
I have a question coming uh, online from our live stream. Oh, hello. <laughs>
that um, that the, the stick of dynamite. Where is uh, my friend there? Yeah, the stick of dynamite. If you could bring some of those into class next time. <laughs> Again, uh, be very careful if you're, now we're, now we're sort of mixing up each other. If you're trying to blow something up, uh, we'll go back to this earlier question down here. Make, make sure that you're, you're loving the institution that you're blowing up for its own good. It, that's that's uh, real discernment work, right? Because, um, <coughs> but it, if you're just angry, it's it's probably not going to be good. Uh, but blowing blowing up parts of things out of out of love uh, may sometimes be necessary. But it's it's uh, difficult work, and the discernment um, uh, has got to be pretty broad. We need to have lots of people being a part of that decision. Uh, because we don't we don't want to harm the, the the jewel in the in the middle of it all. Right? Listen, I love being here, and thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Final word. There was actually a final word tonight. Uh, one to all of our alums who have come. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We're delighted that you came back. One of the great surprises this evening was one of the great pioneers in the AIDS pandemic, Jane Van Zandt, who graduated from the nursing school here when it was one, but went on to do great and marvelous things. I haven't seen Jane in 25 years, so I am delighted to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. You took us at a time when not a lot of people stood up and you stood up and you were counted and you led us in a remarkable way. So thank you, Jane. There'll be a chance to visit with Gene, to meet with Gene, and enjoy a bit of a reception in his and your honor. This is the benefit of the Lowell Lecture. <laughs> so we actually get to dine with each other for a few minutes. Gene will only be here for another half hour. He has been traveling from London to here and he's going home tonight for the first time in a month and a half. One week ago this morning, I had breakfast with the Archbishop of Canterbury at Glasgow. Uh, no one else has heard this news because he's literally just come back to the States. Uh, we are delighted. So if you would, in the lobby of the center, and then come back to us in February because you're going to hear the history of what happened in the church over the last 50 years and why people behaved and acted the way they had. Carolyn Brown, who has done this remarkable book about what happened, uh, will be here in February for the Lowell Lecture, and we hope to see you back then. Thanks a lot. Live stream tomorrow for the back to school. And tomorrow will be a live stream, yet another, because we can't stop looking at the history of Motive Magazine. Thank you.